sat here with Jonathan Arnott, uh, the UKIP MEP for the North East, my part of the world, uh, and Case part of the world, as it happens, given that we live next door to each other. And I was quite taken, Jonathan, by the, the piece that you had in the journal, the piece that you wrote about ESIGs. Um, and it's unusual to find somebody that's not a vapor and not a smoker that actually has that kind of attitude towards ESIGs. First off, what, what made you decide to write it? I, I, I suppose it's just that I know a lot of people, friends of mine, who've been smokers for years, who've moved across to vaping, and you know, there's a health benefit to them for doing so. And it's one of the things that you do see from time to time in the European Parliament that there are moves to regulate. You see that uh, more and more pubs, I suppose, are, are, taking, are taking a view that they, that they don't want people using e-cigarettes in the pubs and, and so on. It just seems, it just seems I, I don't know, that, um, that there's this climate of negativity around it. And it, to me... There is a benefit when people move from to traditional cigarettes to e-cigarettes in terms of the health. It's something which, I suppose, from 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 their point of view, it's something that's, which is a lot cheaper to do. And, um, and and I just I just think that society shouldn't be putting so much effort into making life harder for people who are using e-cigarettes. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, the, the Article 20, as it currently stands, and which is due for implementation on May the 20th in 2016, is being challenged by Totally Wicked, I'm, I'm sure you're aware. Um, that hopefully will happen sometime towards the end of this year, rather than going into next year when it yeah. was originally intended to be. Um, Let's assume for a second that Totally Wicked are successful, as I hope they will be and actually think they will be. It's going to call then for a recasting, I think, of Article 20 as either a completely new directive or to be recast within the currently standing TPD. A couple of questions quickly, and I know you're very, very new to being an MEP. Um, took your seat in July last year, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. The, elections, the election was in May and then take up the seat on the 1st of July. Yeah. So I know it, it, it's, all, it's new to a lot of people, but you're kind of in the same position as I am now. It's, it's, it's really quite, quite good. Um, if it's got to be recast, your committee, the budgetary committee, will have input to that, as will, I think, the, the, the health committees and, and various others. How long do you know how long it would take for that to be recast? And is there any way that Europe might want to say, well, you've got to do this while we're doing it? What would, what would the situation be there? I, I, I don't know in enough detail to, to, to be certain. What I, what I think, you know, these things don't happen overnight. It would take time. I think it would be very difficult for them to put something in place on an interim basis. I think for me personally, you know, coming from this as a, as a UKIP MEP, I'm always asking the question, you know, why should this be done at European level? You know, why is it that 28 countries have to all have the same law on this? Why can't the UK determine our own laws on this kind of thing? So I, I find that if something like this comes before my committee and, be, and before the European Parliament, I suppose there's, there's two things that I'm looking at. Is One is to say, well, we don't need this regulation coming from Brussels. And secondly, if they're doing it anyway, what can I do to limit the negative impact that that's going to have? You know, are there amendments that I can put forward which would, um, which would make the legislation less bad than it, um, the, than it is at the moment, less bad than, than, than it's proposed to be? So I suppose that's, that's the way that I look at, at these things. But I think what's, what we've seen actually with the new uh, with the new European Parliament since the uh, since the European elections because uh, across Europe parties which are perhaps slightly more skeptical of the way things are going have have done very well at those elections because in Greece with the financial crisis and so on um, and and the election of Syriza in Greece as well which is uh, which leads to that question mark over the euro we've seen the Commission has actually gone back into its shell a little bit. So we've not seen the absolute avalanche of new legislation uh, coming through. And of course, the new commission is also finding its feet. So there's not much that has started 
since I took up my position in July that's actually gone all the way through yet. So we're, we're in this sort of strange hiatus period. So actually, I haven't seen these things go through um, go through to, to know exactly how long it's going to take. Mm. Um, it's a, it's a very strange very strange uh, period out there at the moment, and everybody who's there is saying, you know, you're only finding you're having to vote a couple of hundred times in a week. Um, you do realise when things really kick off, it's going to be a thousand times in a, in a week, and that's uh, that just uh, <laughs> to me. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking there's there's a lot going on, but uh, but I'm but I'm told that actually uh, actually that what's what's going to happen is so much greater, and actually that that in itself has problems for scrutiny because if you're not on the relevant committee it's very very difficult to know all the details of everything when uh, when you get that pace of uh, that pace of regulation amendments and so on coming through and so MEPs tend to become experts in their field and just following what staff tell them on everything else and I think it's quite it's quite dangerous actually because if you're following a voting list that's prepared by your group, as, as a lot of the groups do out there, um, it gives a lot of power into the hands of, uh, of those who prepare the voting lists. And the MEPs themselves, it's very difficult to know exactly what the consequences are of a thousand votes in the same week. Yes, and if, and, if, and if somebody manages to tick two boxes that are mutually exclusive, it can cause problems as well. That's not something I'm going to lay at your door, but we did see yeah. that happen no, before. No, it, it can, it can. And, and of course, um, given that you're sitting on the Budgetary Committee, the, the recent moves towards imposing what many see as a punitive tax on ESIGs will be coming before you at some point, I assume, over the current Parliament. Um, if that comes through, what's your stance? Well, I, I just don't see that there is any benefit whatsoever to to taxation uh, on e-cigarettes. I, I don't see how that can have a public health benefit. You know, I'm not here to get into the argument about whether e-cigarettes are 0.1% as harmful as traditional cigarettes or 20% as harmful. I, that is something which is a matter for science. But as long as we know they are substantially less harmful, and as long as we know that people aren't going from being non-smokers to e-cigarettes uh, in any great numbers, and people are moving from traditional cigarettes to e-cigarettes, as long as that is the case, then every time somebody is moving from a traditional cigarette to an e-cigarette, that is having a health benefit for the country. Now, when you tax something, you discourage it. And if you add, you know, as alcohol duty goes up or cigarette duty goes up, as that happens, you know, that, that is done with the aim of, of, of discouraging uh, that activity. And we see that in, you know, in so many policy areas. I mean, it's, it's the, the old externality charge idea, isn't it? That, you know, the congestion charge in London or, or, um, or, the, or the fuel duty. All of these things are done because they believe that there is a harm attached to that activity and that there needs to be taxation to, to cover the cost of that harm. Well, if e-cigarettes are actually overall having a positive impact on public health, the worst thing that you could possibly do is to is to add any duty uh, over and above that. That that would make sense to me. Um, I, I, for the life of me, I think I do sometimes think that governments become addicted to the revenues from their sin taxes, right. um, and it 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 always kind of perplexes me as to what they think they're going to be able to use the money for. In the UK, for instance, Labour has uh, decided that it wants to use tobacco taxes to further education. That obviously is coming from their financial side, from, from the exchequer side, the shadow exchequer. Yet the shadow health people are doing their best to stamp out smoking, drinking and anything else that they want to put sin taxes on. They must realise that that's a conflict. Um, and, and what you're saying is so right. The, you know, we need to stop the EU in general. Actually, I should stop that sentence there, given who I'm talking to. But yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite happy with it. <laughs> yeah. No, we need, we, need, we need to stop governments in general from relying upon sin taxes to fund everything else they want to do. And it, it, 
I've got to say, it seems to me, if they want to spend that amount of money, they maybe need to adjust their priorities a little bit. And if health is a major priority, then it seems certain to me, as you say, that sin taxes on e-cigs is, is just a wrong thing. And I think the, the point that I'd make there is there's a law of diminishing returns. Mm. And if you have a sin tax which is intended to discourage a particular activity, if it succeeds in discouraging that activity, then you will be generating less revenue from that activity. And this is something which never seems to be considered. It's the idea that this, that this new tax which is introduced will generate this revenue for the country, and it's always, it's always based upon uh, the current situation, not the situation they hope to achieve by it. And so I think for that reason, those revenues are, are often spent, um, and having been spent, they then want to protect that revenue, and it's, it's a fundamentally wrong approach to, uh, um, to economics, I suppose. Flawed on a massive basis, yes. Absolutely and, right. You know, and, and, and I see that as a wider issue, and I, I'd, I'd say sometimes you see, the same sort of, you see the same sort of logic applied to all sorts of, uh, all sorts of different taxes as well. And, you know, I, I suppose you don't want to be, me to get too much into the, into the wider politics of it, but I think one of the, one of the things that that any society has to be very, very careful indeed about is, is the idea of introducing punitive taxation and assuming that people will be happy to continue paying it. Yes, I, I, I've got to be honest, I've never quite understood this whole notion where people will say, you know, you're avoiding paying X amount of tax. Um, and, and there is kind of accusations that people don't want to pay the tobacco duty so they'll use smuggled cigarettes and that's a bad thing and it's kind of well what the hell do you expect if you're going to make things unaffordable legitimately but they are more affordable illegitimately then obviously people will go down the illegitimate route and that applies I think as much to e cigs as to anything else if the EU when it pushes this budgetary constraint this this taxation through your committee if that gets through and they're going to make these things hugely expensive to buy legitimately throughout the eu or if the tb is tpd is implemented and they become impossible to buy legitimately in the eu of course people will take a non-legitimate route and then they lose all of the taxation not just the vat not just the duty everything they lose everything um so yes i, I i'm kind of hoping that when the tax thing hits your budgets committee that you are going to be there and fighting against it for us. Well that's certainly my intention you know and and it's a two-way process so if you you know if you let me know what what your concerns are um, then you know, obviously I, you know I can't write a blank check and say everything that you say to me I'm going to instantly agree with but if you let me know what your concerns are then I can at the very least I need to make sure that I'm taking those into account. Well, I'm more than happy to have a constant dialogue uh, with your good self um, because I think the more representation we have in the EU until we can get shot of the EU, the better. Um, for the time being, I want to say thank you very much for joining me. Jonathan Arnott, MEP for the North East of England, um, who has written very well on e-cigs and who I think I'm right in saying has got the right attitude. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Cheers.